right, good afternoon. How are we doing today? Good. Does anybody know what today is? Tuesday? It's Tuesday. It is Tuesday. It is National Blank Day. Janaya. It's National Quesadilla Day. She is correct. We have, now we have days for all sorts of things. Um, however, a couple of years ago, probably about 10 years ago now, your, um, our, I should say, our camp speaker, Brother Burke, um, took it upon himself to honor a particular person in American history by the name of John Clark. And so today, I want you to go ahead and turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 14. Let me read a verse to you, not from your text. We'll get to your text in just a second, but a little trivia question, okay? So here's your trivia question. The verse, Leviticus 25 and verse 10, the text of that verse says, Proclaim liberty throughout all the land unto all the inhabitants thereof. That verse and the text of that verse is found in what famous location? I'll read the verse again. Proclaim liberty throughout all the land unto all the inhabitants thereof. Does that verse ring a bell? Josh, do you know where it is? It is in Philadelphia. But where is it in Philadelphia? On the Liberty Bell. That is correct. All right. So I don't know what you've won, but you've won something. All right. Yeah, you win a quesadilla since today is quesadilla day. Um, When we think about freedom and we think about liberty, when we hear those words, we think America, America. Freedom and liberty is, they're, they're, they're as American as apple pie and baseball or whatever you want to fill in there. We think of freedom and we think of liberty and specifically religious freedom and religious liberty as something that is distinctly American. In fact, you and I, and I include myself in, in this, uh, we've grown up with it so much so that we think that it's normal. But it's actually not normal at all. Um, we trace, oftentimes we, we trace our freedom and our liberty back to our founding fathers. The founding fathers of, of America, where that's James Madison who wrote what famous document? James, you know Robbie? Yeah. What did he the write? Declaration of Independence? No, no, he's close. Sarah, what did he write? He wrote the Constitution and specifically... He wrote the Bill of Rights and the First Amendment, which tells us that Congress shall make no law regarding the establishment of religion. And the idea was that government should not and was not allowed to establish a particular religion. And that was significant and that was important. So we trace it back maybe to James Madison, the Bill of Rights. Maybe we go back to George Washington. Maybe we go back to Thomas Jefferson, who wrote what famous document? You didn't know you were getting American history today. Uh, Fiona, Declaration of Independence. Maybe you go back to Patrick Henry and his speech, give me liberty or give me death. But actually, liberty, the history of liberty, especially for us as Americans, goes back a little bit further than that. All the way back to this man, John Clark, who I have named and titled the pioneer of American liberty. And the reason for why we're talking about this today is uh, Brother Burke, a couple of years ago, decided to, uh, we needed to honor this American hero. And so he, uh, along with uh, Brother Alexander, set up the last Monday in September as National John Clark Day. So that is coming up not a week from today, but less than a week from today, on Monday. You say, why, why is this something that we need to consider? Why is this something that we need to think about? Why is this important? One of the reasons it's important, and one of the reasons we talk about it, is John Clark is one of those heroes that has been largely forgotten. You will not, unfortunately, it's a bit of a tragedy, and there's a long story behind it, but you won't read about him in your paces. I think maybe his name is mentioned one time, but... The, the entire history is glossed over, which is really 
uh, quite a shame. And there's, there's a reason for that, but we won't go, go into that. Um, but it also, uh, the day also brings a truth home to us, a truth that really doesn't just go back to John Clark. It goes back to the Word of God. It goes back to the Bible. You're there in Romans 14. Let's look in verse number 4. Think about what Paul is saying. He says, Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? To his own master he standeth or falleth. Yea, he is holding up, for God is able to make him stand. So you get the idea. Who are you to judge another individual? They are serving their master. And their behavior is between, you know, in that relationship is between them and their master. I don't go and, and go to Chick-fil-A and, and get on the employees for not doing their jobs because that's between the employee and, and Chick-fil-A. It's, 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 not, it's not my realm. It's not my business. That's kind of what he's saying here. One man, look at verse 5. One man esteemeth one day above another. Another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. He that regardeth the day regardeth it unto the Lord. And he that regardeth not the day to the Lord, he doth not regard it. He that eateth, eateth to the Lord, for he giveth God thanks. And he that eateth not to the Lord, he eateth not and giveth, and, and giveth God thanks. What he's saying is, what you do in your life is between you and your ultimate master, God. How you approach God in a religious context is between you and God. Continue reading. For whether we live, or verse 7, For none of us liveth to himself, and no man dieth to himself. For whether we live, we live unto the Lord. And whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Um, whether we live, therefore, or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ both died and rose and revived, that he might be the, be Lord both of the dead and living. But why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. And here it is. So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. For you. Individually, in your life, one day, you will stand before God. God will judge you. I'm not going to be able to give account for you, nor do I necessarily want to have to give an account for you. You will have to do that yourself. Your, your parents won't be able to give that account. You won't be able to say, well, I go to such and such a church or I'm a citizen of such and such a place. It'll just be you and God. Which is why we implore you on a regular basis, where do you stand before God? We challenge you, what do you believe? What, what do you think this life is all about? What are you going to do in eternity? Because I can't give an account for you. I can't answer to God for you. I can't step in and say, oh, no, you know, I remember, I remember Josh. He was kind of a good kid. He should be. I can't do that. I can't do that. He's going to have to stand before God and answer for his behavior and his actions by himself. This is a key principle. It's a key phrase. That when it comes to how you and I approach God, we're going to have to be, as, as Paul says, let every man, I think it's in verse 5, let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. Every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. This is a biblical principle that has been a part of what we believe and what is, what is and has been distinct about us as Baptists for a very long time. Perhaps you've seen this before, um, and that is some of the distinct beliefs that make Baptists a little different. We believe in the authority of, of the Bible, all right? We believe in the autonomy of the church and outside of a denominational 
context. And we don't have time to explain all these things, but we believe in the priesthood of the believer, the fact that we're going to approach God and we can approach God on the basis of Jesus Christ, not through a priest, not through a church, not through some saints, but we have direct access to God. We believe in the two ordinances, which are baptism, baptism and the Lord's Supper. That Those are two things that God gave us to observe, to remember him and remember what he's done uh, for us. We believe in individual soul liberty, which we're going to come back to. We believe in saved membership, that the members of a church ought to be people who are saved. And you say, well, duh, but that's not how a lot of most religion is practiced. We believe in two opposite offices in the New Testament, the pastor and the, and the deacon. Uh, and we believe in the separation of church and state. And so when we talk about freedom, when we talk about liberty, that idea and that subject comes from these two principles right here. Individual soul liberty. Every individual should have the right to worship God in, in, in concert or in accord with his own understanding of the scripture without coercion as far as it doesn't infringe on the, God, uh, the God-given rights of other people. Individual soul liberty. We also believe and have stood for, for hundreds and thousands of years on the principle of the separation of church and state. The Bible clearly states that the, the, the state, the government, is to administer civil or secular law and the church is to, to minister to man's spiritual needs. And the two are separate ent entities and should not be intertwined, especially under the same head. Jesus said, render unto Caesar, the things that are Caesar's, and unto God, the things that are God's. There is a distinction. Some people have tried to describe that distinction, and I think it's an appropriate dis distinction, by laying out the Ten Commandments and the two tables of the law. The first table is how man approaches God. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt uh, not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. And the, the first four commandments on the first table have to do with your relationship with God. And by the way, those are things that really, especially when it comes to commandment number one, cannot be enforced. I can't force you to believe anything. I can maybe bring some torture and try to get you. I, I might be able to get you to say something but I can't necessarily get you to believe something. It's an individual choice. That first table is how man approaches God. The second table is how man deals with man. Thou shalt not lie thou shalt, or, or bear false witness. Thou shalt not steal. All right, those kind of commands. And they've made the distinction that it is the church, it is religion that deals with man's relationship with God. And it's the state that can, can dictate in, in law man's relationship to one another. That you don't have the freedom to murder the person who's sitting next to, to you. You don't have the liberty to go and take all of their belongings. You don't have the freedom to go and defraud them or deceive them or lie to them, trick, to that, trick them into uh, uh, giving you all of their things. Like you don't have that freedom. And governments exist and were ordained by God in the book of Genesis chapter 9 to protect human life and the rights that God has given. And Baptists, down through the, the, the ages and the centuries, have held to the distinction between those two things and held to individual soul liberty and separation of church and state. Again, we've grown up with these things so much that the impression is, at least it was my impression, that not only was this normal, but it was always the case. And nothing could be really further from the truth. In fact, when the New World was discovered by Christopher Columbus in, he sailed the ocean blue in 1492. You're learning something in school. This is great. When, when he discovered the New World, all kingdoms and empires had their own state religion. All of them. Whether we're talking about the Ottoman Turks, whose state religion would be Oh, you don't know? The Ottomans? What was that? They would, Islam would be their, their state religion. Or we go to Western Europe and, and we, have, uh, we have, oh, you should know this, right? If, you've, if you're, I think Robbie had this in his history pace. Um, 
in uh, the, the country that Christopher Columbus was sailing for was the country of? Was it Spain or Portugal? I'd have to look it up. But both Spain and Portugal had the official state religion of Roman Catholicism. So when, when, when our, our country was first, the, the area of our country, the, the land of the New World was discovered, every kingdom and empire had its own state religion. That started all the way back with the declaration of a, of a Roman emperor named Constantine when he, in the 300s, declared Christianity and Catholic universal Christianity to be the state religion of the Roman Empire. That's where the Catholic Church began. All the way through the Dark Ages up to Martin Luther and the Reformation, there was, a, there was one singular state church, and that was the universal Catholic Church. But then, of course, some of you are familiar with the Protestant Reformation in the 16th century. That kind of challenged some of the beliefs of the state church, the Catholic Church. But that sort of began a struggle of not whether or not we should have a state church, but which state church should be the right state church. Should it be the Church of England? Should it be the Dutch Reformed Church? Should it be the Catholic Church? What should it be? But we're missing the point. The point is this. Should there be a state church? Well, I think biblically we could demonstrate that there should not be. So the same was true. Going now to the beginning of our nation and our country, the same was true as people began to come to the new world. They began to set up colonies, and each of those colonies had state religions. And I'll show that to you in just a second. But let's get to John Clark and talk about why in the world we should honor such a man. Now, this is not a photograph. Somebody, it's, a, it's a painting. Some, this is what somebody decided he might have looked like. Um, but we honor John Clark for three particular reasons. If, if you're taking notes, you can write these down. I'll give them to you nice and easy. Three distinct reasons why we celebrate John Clark Day. First of all, the church. The church. What does that mean? All right. Um, so in, in 1637, all right, so this is before the date on the slide, but 1637, John Clark came to the New World. At this time, this is what the New World looked like. The, the, uh, uh, the pilgrims had come, and they had established the, the, uh, um, the colony of Plymouth. Some of you didn't even know there was a colony called Plymouth. But when they came in 1620, they established the colony of Plymouth. Uh, the Puritans would come. Another brand of the Church of England would come, and they would establish Boston and eventually put those things together, that would be the Massachusetts Bay Colony. And the third colony would be Hartford, or what would become Connecticut. And you see a little bit of that representation here on the right. And so when John Clark came to the New World, he came as some. we don't know a lot from his early life, um, because he is a pretty common name, John Clark. And so there's many, many individuals with that name, and so we don't know exactly, we know where he was born, but we don't know a lot about his education or what church he was a part of, or where he was ordained as a preacher. We don't know those things for certain. Some have, have, uh, have, have given some ideas of that, but we don't know for certain. But he came here as both a trained medical doctor and also a trained minister. He came in 1637. But when he came to the New World, hoping that he might find a different religious um, environment than what existed in the old world, he found the same religious intolerance that existed in the place where he came from. In fact, he came into Boston in particular, and there was a debate about all, all sorts of these different religious ideas. There was a lady named Ann Hutchison who was holding a Bible study in her house and because she was doing so, they were talking about religious ideas and religious beliefs that went contrary to what the, the official church, the what would be called the Congregational Church, the Puritan Church of Massachusetts, what they taught. And there was a debate. What should we do about this? We can't, we can't allow this to happen. We can't allow people to believe these, these different things, these different ideas. And so many of, these, many of those individuals were threatened with banishment. In fact, there would be one individual named Roger Williams 
who the year prior to this in 1636, he had some beliefs that went contrary to the state church, and he was banished, which means he was put out of the colony. Nobody in the colony could help him out. Nobody in the colony could give him food. Nobody in the colony could, uh, um, in, uh, in commerce could buy or sell or trade from him. It was basically a death sentence. He was, he was banished to the wilderness, and most likely he would die there, except he was a pretty smart uh, an ingenious kind of guy, and he eventually he would go to Rhode Island. We're going to get to that um, in just a moment. But um, And so John Clark came to the New World, and there was this grand debate, this disagreement over what is right to believe and what is not. And if you believe the wrong thing, you're going to incur the wrath of the, of the government. You're going to be arrested. You're going to be prosecuted. And so he gathered those dissidents together, those individuals together, and he said, we need to go somewhere. The, the, the new world is large. Perhaps there's somewhere where we could go, where we could practice um, religion freely, where we could establish a place where not only do we get to practice freely, but everyone else does as well. And so he gathered them together. Initially, they got in a boat and, and fled to the, the north up here to what is now Maine. It was the property of Massachusetts back then. And uh, they spent a winter there. But, of course, up in Maine, the winters are pretty cold. So they decided we need to, we need to go somewhere else. And at that time, they were invited by Roger Williams, the banished Roger Williams, who had fled to the, the wilderness here and had set up the Providence Plantation in 1636. And Roger Williams says, you need to, to come here. And if you come here, I've got an idea. Maybe we could establish something. Maybe we could make a colony where there's true religious freedom. And so John, John Clark and, and the people who were with him sailed from way up here in, in uh, um, New Hampshire all the way down around Cape Cod, Massachusetts, all the way through this uh, Vineyard Sound, or I don't know if it was Vineyard Sound or Nantucket Sound. They, they came around here and basically landed here on an island called Aquidneck Island. Of course, today it's part of Rhode Island, which is right here as far as the state is concerned. But uh, they came here specifically to the northern part of this island and founded the, the town of Portsmouth. And after arriving um, on Aquidneck Island, uh, they formed the first Baptist church in America in 1638. So you can kind of do the math. The pilgrims came to the land of 20 in the year 1600 and plenty, 20, plenty, 20, get it? They came to the land of 20 in 1620. Okay, so they came in 1620. They're over here. Oh, sorry, let me... Uh, they're over here in this area. Let's see, where's the button? They're over here in this area in the, the colony of Plymouth. They did come here for religious freedom, but the colony they set up was religious freedom so they could practice religion the way they saw fit. Actually, an interesting thing I learned in just brushing up and some study for this message was there was actually a teenager, 13-year-old young man who came over on the Mayflower with the pilgrims, and he grew up and he began to study his Bible and as a as a young man, he came to a particular belief when it came to believer's baptism. He rejected infant baptism and therefore was excommunicated from the Plymouth colony and would come over and actually start a church right here in a place called Tiverton, which is now Tiverton, Rhode Island. Back then it was Tiverton, Massachusetts. But the pilgrims came in 1620, so we're only talking about 18 or so years later um, John Clark and the people who are traveling with him come to Aquidneck Island and they would establish the colony of, uh, not establish, but they would come to the colony of Rhode Island and establish this town called Portsmouth. In fact, you can go to Portsmouth, uh, Rhode Island today. This is called Founders Brook or Founders Park. You can visit the park and there's even a copy of uh, the Portsmouth Compact that they wrote. You'll see all the names, including his name. I've been there and, and, and have seen that. But eventually they decided that the better place to be would, would not be in the northern part of the island, but where the ships would come in is in the south. And so they would move down here, and you can actually see Newport, uh, Rhode Island, and, and that's where the church would find its permanent home. You can go to Newport, Rhode Island, and still see this church today. In fact, you see it right there on the sign, United Baptist Church, established 1638. Did you go there, Sarah? Did you remember seeing that? 
You guys, they were in Newport. I think you guys saw something else. But anyway, you can go to this church today. And so we honor John Clark because he was the man who started, founded, and pastored the First Baptist Church in America. But that's not the only reason why we celebrate John Clark Day. Number two, the second reason is not only the church, but the cost. We're fast forwarding a couple years. We're going from 1638 now to 1651. A few years prior to this, in 1649... John Clark went from Rhode Island, from Newport, crossed the, the, the waters a little ways into Massachusetts, or specifically Plymouth Territory, to a town called Seekonk. It's now called Rehoboth, Massachusetts um, today. And he, he went there because he heard that there were some people who were having a dispute with their Puritan congregational minister over the subject of baptism. And so he went to preach and to form those individuals into a church, which was not necessarily a legal thing to do, but they were going to do it anyway. One of those men who was there, who he found, who was struggling with this issue and didn't know quite what the scriptures taught, and, and he found him and, and helped him. One of those men was named Obadiah Holmes. Eventually, Obadiah Holmes would come with John Clark back to Rhode Island. And in 1651, just two years later, John Clark, Obadiah Holmes, and John Crandall, these three men from Newport, Rhode Island, would travel to Lynn, Massachusetts. Uh, I think I could bring, let's, can we go to our map just to give you an idea of where that is? It's, it's actually kind of a far trip because here is Newport way down here. Boston's like right there, and Lynn is to the north of that. So they traveled all the way up there, and they were meeting a man by the name of William Witter. And William Witter was someone who, boy, he, he was kind of an instigator. Um, and he, they, they, especially in this area of religion, he had some strong beliefs, some more Baptist beliefs. And the authorities didn't really like him all of that much because of some of those expressed beliefs. Well, when John Clark and Obadiah Holmes and John Crandall showed up, um, they said, well, we're going to have a service in the home of William Witter. And so they did. They had that service, and actually Obadiah Holmes was preaching when the constables broke in. This is an illegal religious meeting. They arrested all three men. The men were then forced to attend a Puritan religious service. They were taken to a real church to go to church. And, of course, this was against their will. Uh, they walked into that church. They were supposed to, as a matter of respect and custom, remove their hats. But, of course, they didn't respect these churches at all, so they refused to the, remove their hats. And so they had their hats forcibly knocked off of their heads. John Clark stood at the end of the service and explained to the congregation why they refused to, to remove their hats. The men were, were detained that evening, then brought before local magistrates the following day. They were then, after they were charged, free to return to William Witter's house before being taken to Boston for their arraignment. And there in that service, Clark conducted that service and, and Obadiah Holmes baptized three individuals. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> so all of them were taken to Boston for trial on July 31st, yeah, 1651. Um, many of them were held in prison, in jail, and this is the actual site of the prison there on the Freedom Trail in Boston. And the reason why we believe it's the site is because of the description, which is right there on the wall. Um, and it matches with a description that Obadiah Holmes wrote about. So it seems likely that they were held in that place, and they were held for trial. At the trial, the governor said that these three men, for what they did, deserved death. And he would not have such trash brought into his jurisdiction. That's a quote. All right. That's what he said. The men were charged with, here's, here were the five charges. They were charged and convicted of holding an unauthorized religious meeting. Disrupting an authorized meeting. Now you know what that means, wearing their hats, right? Number three, they were charged with administering sacraments illegally. Baptism, okay, um, specifically. Number four, they maintained that the Massachusetts churches were not true churches. Horror of horrors against the law. And number five, they maintained that infant baptism was false baptism. 
And so these men were sentenced without any accuser or witnessing speaking out or witnesses speaking out against them. The outcome of the trial was a specific fine. Obadiah Holmes was fined 30 pounds. John Clark was fined 20 pounds. More, more than likely, the reason why Obadiah Holmes was, found, was fined 30 pounds is that he was the one who did the baptizing. And then, from what I was reading, too, he, he might have actually been the one giving the, the, the sermon when the constables arrived. But John Clark was, was his pastor. He was there. So anyway, he was fined 30 pounds, Clark 20 pounds, Crandall 5 pounds. Holmes had been given... The heaviest fine, oh, I did write this down, uh, because, because of his excommunication back in Massachusetts. Remember that? Uh, we talked about that. And for administering the baptisms in Lynn. Clark protested those heavy fines, and the governor replied that Clark was worthy to be hanged. In court, Governor Endicott told Clark that his beliefs would not stand up to those of the Puritan ministers. In other words, you, you couldn't last in a debate We'd prove you wrong. Clark responded uh, to this by writing a letter to the court from prison the following day, accepting the challenge to have a debate with the Puritan ministers on religious beliefs and practices. The challenge was initially accepted. It's like, oh yeah, we'll debate you. But then mysteriously, Clark's fine was paid. The 20 pounds was paid by some friends without his knowledge and all of a sudden, he was released from jail. He immediately fled the area and, then was, uh, and was then accused by the Puritan elders of defaulting or running away from the debate challenge. He made two more attempts to debate the Puritan clergy, but the case was dropped by the court and the debate never took place. Clark, Clark had drafted four points of discussion, which later he actually published um, his beliefs and positions. That leaves two men, John Crandall and Obadiah Holmes. Along with Clark, John Crandall's fine was paid, but when Obadiah Holmes specifically found out what was going on, he refused to have his fine paid. And so he was taken out on the Boston Commons, the square there. Actually, this is where this event took place, there in Massachusetts, right there in downtown Boston. And because his fine was unpaid, he was sentenced to 30 lashes with a three-corded whip. And he took every single one of those lashes. They said the, it's been reported that the, the blood that came from those wounds would flow down his back and would literally fill his shoes. For, for weeks, the, the beating was so brutal. I'll, I'll say this, and then we'll talk about the later effects of this. It was so brutal that people in the crowd began crying out at the brutality of what was taking place. For weeks, he was not able to sleep other than on his elbows and knees due to the pain that was, that was uh, brought forth on him. In fact, a lot of people say because of the severity of the penalty that the idea was to actually kill him. Unfortunately, that didn't take place. This is the painting commemorating this event as some men lead him away. There's a lot of interesting details about what happened there. We're not going to get into those. Um, and of course, at the very end of that beating, he turned to um, the, the man carrying out the punishment of the fine, and he said, you have beaten me as with roses. Rose petals aren't very hard, right? You know, roses. That was the idea. In other words, God gave me the strength to stand for what I believe is right. Of course, where did he get those beliefs? He got those beliefs from the discipleship of his pastor, John Clark. So we honor John Clark for his role in the cost, the sacrifice that he was willing to pay to stand for what was right. But that is actually not the only reason that we celebrate John Clark. There's actually a third reason, and it may actually be the most significant reason of all. In case you're interested, there's Obadiah Holmes, where he's buried, um, an interesting place, to, beautiful place to visit. But the third reason, perhaps even most significant, when we talk about freedom and liberty, is the charter. The charter was, was officially ratified in 1663. At that time, and if I have the ability to go back to 
the, uh, the maps and show you. At that time, Roger Williams did have uh, the legal authority to set up Providence Plantation, but you'll note, you, if you can picture the, the map in your mind, that uh, colony was surrounded by Connecticut, Massachusetts, Plymouth. Sometimes, they would, sometimes they're referred to as united colonies. They had the same state religion of congregationalism, and so they had a similarity in that. Also, the area of Rhode Island was a very fertile area and, and actually was growing, and so they not only wanted it for religious reasons, but they wanted it for economic reasons. And they also wanted to shut down this sort of experiment, the cesspool of New England, where people could come and practice whatever religion they want, and maybe none at all. Horror of horrors, all right? Couldn't allow that. And so they, there were multiple encroachments on that, that area and that territory, and especially after what happened in Boston, they decided what, what they needed to do is they needed to get the boundaries officially recognized. This is Rhode Island from the king himself. We have a right to be here. And because of what the king says, you know, you're not allowed to, to encroach on that liberty. You're not allowed to take that liberty away. Something needed to be done. And so both Roger Williams and John Clark would travel to England in 1652. So that's only about a year or so after what took place in uh, Massachusetts there in Boston. Um, and so they went. Roger Williams was only there for a short time, and then he returned back here um, to the colonies. But John Clark stayed, and he stayed for 12 years. That's a long time. That's a long time for a pastor to be away from his church. Uh, do you want to take a guess on who pastored the church in his absence? Obadiah Holmes, all right? There you go. Um, but he stayed for 12 years. And I'm not going to get into all the English history because I English history is, I don't get most of it. It's craziness. Um, but whatever. There is, there, is this, there is this power struggle between Oliver Cromwell and then the, the royal family. And the power was exchanging hands a couple of times. And so it was a very tumultuous time to try to get anything done. And so he was trying to, to wait out for the, the right time to get this thing through. There were other forces that were at work uh, from some of the other colonies to basically get the king to give them all of the area. And there goes, there goes the religious freedom. There goes what they had worked hard to establish. But John Clark was patient. He worked very hard for 12 years to get this charter, the official governing document from the king of England. But in 1663, he was able to do that very thing. Why are we talking about this? Why is it important? Why does the painter of this painting commemorate the event? There's the king right there on his throne, and he's got his royal dog in his lap, if you've ever seen that. Um, all of these individuals, have, there's, they're, they're named, and we're not going to go into the history between or with all of those, but John Clark is the man in the middle. He's holding the charter, because it was John Clark who authored the charter during that 12 years. And he finally got the king to uh, affix his official approval and signature to that document. What was significant about that document? Well, there's a lot. Um, it was a fairly large document. And some of you have seen this. I've showed this to you before. Um, that document is, is preserved in Providence, Rhode Island in the State House. Um, you see how long it is? I'm not a short individual. So I would imagine my guess would be five and a half to six feet long. It's not uh, displayed like this anymore because here on the seams of the document, there, 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 it began to, to pull away. So they decided that, that uh, hanging it like that was not the wisest move. So they took the pieces separately and laid it out. Like, like if you go to Washington, D.C., you can still see a copy of the Declaration of Independence laid out. That way it'll preserve better. But I got to see it. This is probably about 10 years ago um, in this State. And what was significant is that inside this document that he wrote, there were specific um, references to the idea that we're talking about, religious freedom. In fact, if you go to Rhode Island today, if you go to the State House right here, right there, you will see a quote from this document. It's, it's carved right into, they call it the freeze. Um, if you're an architecture individual. It's carved right into the, the freeze, and I'll read it to you. He said, that, is, that it is much on their hearts, if they may be permitted, 
to hold forth a lively experiment that a most flourishing civil state may stand and best be maintained with full liberty and religious concernments. I mean, that sounds good. That sounds nice. What's the significance of it? The significance is this, that up into, up till this point in history, there had never been a governing document that recognized and established soul liberty and the separation of church and state. Full liberty and religious concernments. This is 1663, over a hundred years prior to our Declaration of Independence, but it was very much a forerunner to that document. Later on, um, John Clark would write in this document, which, which received approval miraculously from the king, that no person within said colony at any time hereafter shall be in any wise molested. That's the idea of harassed. They would not be harassed, punished, disquieted, or called into question for any differences of opinion in matters of religion. I wonder what he was thinking about when he wrote that phrase. Perhaps he was thinking about the price that his friends paid for his freedom. Perhaps he was thinking about the physical price that his dear friend Obadiah Holmes paid because of his religious opinion. So no, no person may be harassed, punished, disquieted, or called into question for any differences in opinion in matters of religion and do not actually disturb the civil peace of our said colony, but that all and every person and persons may from time to time and at all times hereafter freely and fully have and enjoy his and their own judgments and consciences in matters of religious concernments. Leaving nothing to chance. Very detailed in what it says. There's a historian by the name of Thomas Bicknell, and I read this and I was like, wow, this is a pretty good quote. This is what he said. He said, Nowhere on the face of the earth and among civilized men did civil and soul liberty exist. This is why this is significant. It had never, ever happened before. It's first clear, full, deliberate, organized and permanent establishment in the world can now, meaning the establishment of soul liberty, it can now be traced back to the colony of Rhode Island on the island of Aquidneck in Narragansett Bay under the leadership and inspiration of Dr. John Clark. Unfortunately, John Clark did not live long enough to see what would happen a hundred years. He actually died in 1676, 100 years, nice and even, before the Declaration of Independence and the recognition of God-given rights that governments do not have the right to violate, which would lead to the foundation of the United States of America, which would lead to eventually the First Amendment, all tracing back, the roots going back to the First Baptist Church and the First Baptist Pastor in the New World. Unfortunately, he didn't live long enough to see how far-reaching his document, what he wrote, how far-reaching it would become. And it would be far-reaching. In fact, this document would be in force for over, oh, I should have looked it up. It's, I think it's close to 150 years. And the only reason why they had to amend it, I think it was sometime around the Civil War, was just some, some uh, legal technicalities, some, some uh, differences in town names and stuff. Um, but it stood for that long. And it's an, an incredibly important document. So this is why on the church calendar there is John Clark Day, the last Monday of September. Let me answer this last question and we'll be done. Why is this significant? Why is this important? Because I, 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 I know some of you are thinking, okay, that's nice. What does that mean to us? Why are we even talking about this? Well, two thoughts. Let me give these to you and we'll be done. I want you to understand that liberty and religious 
liberty is a gift that you enjoy. We don't view it as a gift very much. We just kind of view it as, this, isn't this how the world has always been? But it has been a gift. People paid the price. John Clark gave a, over a decade of his life just so that you and I could enjoy, that, enjoy religious freedom, the ability to make up our own mind, to believe what we want to believe, approach God how we think God has told us to from the scriptures. It's a gift to us. We've received a gift. And there's always threats. There's always people trying to take it away. You say, you mean there's like religions trying to come in and take over? I don't know about that, but there is a religion that is taking over our country, and it is the religion of secular, secularism, humanism. Humanism has some core doctrinal beliefs it even has a sacrament, the sacrament of abortion, the freedom to choose what I do with my own body, except it's not yours, it's someone else's. And if you don't agree, if you don't agree with, as we heard on Sunday, the accepted narrative, then you might not have a place in society. You might not be able to get the job that you want. You might, not able to, you might not be able to get the grant money that you need to do your job. You might not be able to voice your opinion on social media. You might, not, you might not be able to eventually worship God the way you believe God has told you to worship. You say, that's a little over the top. I don't know if it's quite that bad. Okay, you, you got some years ahead of you, some decades ahead of you. I'll come talk to you in a couple decades and we'll see you'll probably be like, oh yeah, I get it now. I see it now. So it's in, the, it's in the process of being taken away. And it's now your generation, my generation as well, it's, it's our responsibility to remember some of these heroes to know what we believe and why we believe it and take a stand for it. Is this important or is it not? And the importance goes to this right here. The free distribution of the gospel is at stake whether that's the free distribution on the internet or the free distribution in the public square, whether or not I can stand and take this book and read it out loud and not be arrested. No one would ever be arrested for doing that in the United States. Oh, contraire. It actually, it, it actually has happened. Now, thankfully, we have a constitution. Thankfully, we have the things that have been put in place by our founding fathers and eventually... The, the, uh, the person who was arrested for that, eventually they, they were let go and they were released and there was no penalty or fine. I'm thankful for that. But you see, there's encroachments on that liberty and eventually the free distribution of the gospel is at stake. Our country, we're, we are gifted to live where we live. The greatest propagation of the gospel through Missionaries going to foreign countries and taking the truth of God's word has taken place largely from our country. Do you know why that's the case? Because we have religious freedom. And it will cease to be the case as we walk away from God, as we don't value our religious freedom anymore. Now, that doesn't mean God's going to be like, oh no, I lost America, what am I going to do? No, he'll use somebody else. But for now, we have this gift and we ought to do our best to try to protect it. This is why we celebrate John Clark Day as a hero in American liberty. And I hope you can appreciate some of the liberty that you and I enjoy today. Let's close in a word of prayer. Father, thank you for what we've heard and what we've learned today. So much that's here, so much that could have been said. But I thank you for the heroes that have gone before. I thank you for John Clark and his willingness to take a stand for that which is right, his willingness to go and begin, start, plant the First Baptist Church in America, his willingness to pay the price to preach and to, to give the truth of your word and eventually enshrine this wonderful, beautiful thought that man should be free because we are accountable ultimately to you and to you alone. 
I pray, Lord, this, this afternoon for those who sit here that might be lost. One day, I'm not going to be able to stand before God for them. Their parents won't be able to stand before God for them. They're going to have to give an account for themselves. And I pray that you'd arrest them with that thought. Yes, they have freedom. They have the freedom to make up their own minds. That's a wonderful thing. But one day they'll give an account for that decision in front of you. And I pray that they would take that thought seriously. Thank you for teaching us here uh, this afternoon. In Jesus' name, amen.